getting a lot of material to cover today, so I might be talking a little bit fast uh, so we can get to Brad Rippey um, in the second half of the hour. Um, but starting here uh, in South Dakota, where I'm at, in northeastern, north central South Dakota, um, kind of a typical picture of my area with a, a field that never was able to get planted this spring. Um, and this picture was taken not too long ago, about a month ago, um, but still a beautiful landscape up here in South Dakota. All right, just to, to highlight kind of the main areas that I'm going to cover today, talking about recent conditions, kind of where we're at, where we've been the last 30 days or so since the last webinar, uh, looking at some impacts across the region in various um, sectors and, and regions, and then um, look at the outlooks, uh, which we'll spend a fair bit of time on looking ahead uh, over the next few months. Uh, this is a picture, um, thank you to Henry Regis of Colorado who uh, snapped that just yesterday of the Cameron Peak Fire. I believe that's the Big Thompson River Canyon, not exactly sure. Um, but uh, we'll talk more about wildland fire here uh, later in the impact section. Uh, look back, so fire again is a theme um, and this is a picture of a cornfield in southwestern Minnesota uh, that was burned um, a week or so ago, um, adjacent to a dry area, and uh, just took a simple cigarette out the window that started this whole field on fire. Um, unfortunately, it's pretty pretty tough impact there. So, so not just the big wildland fires, but also um, field fires, harvest fires, are a pretty common theme in the last month. So looking back the last uh, whole month, uh, that, that was September, um, looking at this data from NOAA, looking at how September ranked in temperature uh, compared to the last 126 Septembers, 126 years of record here. Um, anything in that kind of light gray color is near normal. Blues um, in the bottom third of the historical range of temperatures for the month. Um, and then light orange, uh, those were in the upper third of the range of temperatures for September over the last 126 years. So you can see uh, across the north central states here, Montana, Wyoming, kind of leaning on the warmer side for September. Um, Iowa, uh, Kansas on the cooler side, but most of the rest of us near normal. Um, but I'd say too, we saw a lot of extremes, ups and downs throughout the month. And that was maybe kind of the story of the season overall as we look at the growing season and uh, Brad uh, Rippey will talk about some of the ag um, impacts and, and final information for the season so far, but uh, certainly uh, near normal for much of the region from the Dakotas to Ohio down to Missouri and Kansas. Um, but, you know, a handful of states around us, uh, including Michigan, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, all uh, leaning on the warmer side uh, as far as the last six months overall, that's at April through September, um, to, to illustrate the growing season. Um, again, we saw a lot of flip-flopping of warm periods, cool periods, back and forth. So overall, um, it looks like near normal growing, growing temperatures, growing season temperatures. Precipitation here, just looking at the month of September again, compared to 126 uh, years on the record here. Um, leaning drier than average for most of the region, especially in the north and west. Um, Indiana kind of sticks out in the eastern Corn Belt as well as uh, the bottom third driest of September's on history. Um, and again, we'll see part of this show up on the drought monitor later as we uh, look at changes in the drought situation. Um, so certainly a big change of pace uh, in a lot of the region that struggled with excess water in the Missouri River Basin in particular last year this time. And then overall looking at the growing season and how that ranked as well, this is the last six months, April through September again, uh, the light tan colors in the bottom third of rankings of the last 126 years, that medium brown color, bottom tenth um, uh, of the of the 126 years on record. So Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, um, 
fit into that bottom tenth um, of driest years on record um, as far as statewide numbers go. I um, mean, you see a handful of states there, Ohio, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, kind of near normal as far as precipitation goes, um, but very similar uh, to the temperature story where a lot of ups and downs, you had wet periods, dry periods, some very localized heavy rainfall, um, and some areas that have had some severe drought. So um, it's been uh, a mixed bag and maybe local conditions may vary as the story uh, here for precipitation. Looking back um, really at the last 30 days, so this is uh, September 14th through October 13th, so more or less since the last webinar of this series, uh, looking at the departure from average or normal temperature um, for the last 30 days, and you see a lot of oranges and reds that indicate warmer than average temperatures across much of the region, the west and north in particular. Um, in the east, looking at Illinois uh, to Michigan, over to Ohio and Kentucky, um, cooler than average overall um, for the last 30 days, um, as we uh, just since the last webinar. But what's really remarkable in the last 30 days uh, since mid-September has been the extraordinary dry conditions, especially. Um, in Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, and westward. Um, you look at percent of normal precipitation here for the last 30 days. Um, a lot of that maroon color um, was near zero for the last 30 days, near zero rainfall um, over that period. So it's really um, been incredibly dry uh, since, since mid-September. But that's still true over the, the eastern Corn Belt as well. They have had some rain, but still much below average, you know, in that red color, 50% or less uh, below average. So um, you can say that's probably true over much of the region. Um, that's kind of the story for the last month. And we've seen this translate into soil moisture and um, kind of leading up to, to what I'll share with the drought monitor situation as of this morning. But uh, looking here at, at uh, NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, their soil moisture anomaly um, for this time of year and anything in those warm colors, yellow, orange, red, drier than average for this time of year. And you see a couple bullseyes there over Northwest Iowa, um, another area over Northern Indiana and so on, um, where we are seeing uh, some growing anomalies as far as difference from average soil moisture for this time of year. But really much or all, almost all the region is um, drier than average to some degree at this point. And looking at the U.S. Drought Monitor here just for um, what we call the, the Weather Service's central region. Um, and uh, Brad Rippey will show the national map later in his presentation, but you can see certainly the, the western states here, the Rocky Mountain states, uh, have really battled drought more than the rest of us, although there are pockets certainly um, in southeastern South Dakota and adjacent northwestern Iowa, as I mentioned, in the soil moisture map, um, and also far southwest Missouri, similar situation with uh, extreme drought now. Uh, in those areas. And um, we'll see that that's a mixed bag of positive and negative impacts um, this year. Certainly up here in the South Dakota area, we have not seen a dry fall uh, such as this in, in a number of years, especially in the eastern part of the state. So it's really quite a change of pace um, from, from recent years. Sorry, backwards, so forwards. Okay, forwards. <laughs> and this is looking at the change of the drought monitor categories. So if you look at the categories of D0 to D4 that were on the previous map, uh, anything yellow or orange color um, got worse as far as dry or drought conditions. So you can see how much yellow and orange has dominated much of the drought areas. Um, gray areas had no change, so um, they held steady more or less um, over the last four weeks. And uh, a few small areas of, of improvement, mostly in um, eastern Iowa 
and adjoining um, Illinois and, and up into Wisconsin a little bit up that way. Um, but in general, we saw degrading conditions as far as drought goes. Again, um, given the, the warmer, slightly warmer temperatures in some areas and dry primarily lack of rainfall has contributed uh, to, to the drought worsening across the region. So looking at impacts here a little bit, um, touching on uh, a few different topics here. Um, just wanted to share this picture as well from um, someone I know down in southern South Dakota on the Missouri River last weekend. Um, the river is getting to be so low that you can start to see uh, shipwrecks such as the USS Northern Alabama that actually sunk in 1870. And this is, um, uh, uh, her friend out there actually walking on it um, and <clears throat> it, it was last seen as far as I could find um, about 2004 or 5 was the last time the water was low enough in the Missouri to see this where, where people were documenting um, all the shipwrecks in the Missouri so um, really interesting how different a year ago uh, to this year has been. Looking at frost and freeze dates um, uh, this is from the Midwest Regional Climate Center, looking at the date of the first 32 degree uh, frost uh, for this season, for this fall. Uh, and anything in the blue area had that temperature or lower sometime in September, uh, about easily a month earlier than last year for almost everyone in, that, in um, the, the Western Corn Belt, at least part of the Northern area. Um, and about three weeks earlier than average uh, for a lot of a lot of the Dakotas and Nebraska and so on. The green areas uh, just had their first frost probably within the last week or so, within within the month of October, um, month maybe week and a half or so. But you can see the tan areas. There's still several areas that still have not had a 32 degree frost. Although this morning I know there were some areas in South Dakota that finally did. Um, so I'm guessing there's some other areas too that, that got colder and, and will be getting cold here this week. First 28 degrees, so hard freeze. Uh, again, we have we had early freeze or frost on September 8th and 9th there in the western Dakotas and adjoining Montana, Wyoming. Again, earlier than average uh, for most of those areas. Um, but a lot of areas still in the region and um, you know, in the central and west eastern part of this region here that we're talking about today, uh, still has not seen a hard freeze yet. Uh, but again, you know, they're pretty well advertised. I think we're going to see some cooler temperatures ahead in the coming days, and I think the colors might fill in on this map here in the near future. One other topic here on wildland fires. So um, I showed a picture earlier of the Cameron Peak fire from just yesterday. Uh, it really made a run over the last few days. I've heard 20 to 30,000 acres uh, since Tuesday. Now the largest fire in Colorado history, and there's a map of its perimeter as of this morning um, on the left side of the screen. Over 164,000 acres uh, as of this morning was reported as its size. Um, also not too far away to the north of there, the Mullen Fire, which is in Wyoming and in northern Colorado, it's only 25 miles from the perimeter of the Cameron Peak Fire. And that fire, the Mullen Fire, has over 176,000 acres um, already burned. So uh, quite a bit of activity up there. Uh, one of the primary impacts we're seeing is air quality um, across the region. And we've seen um, smoke carry across, you guys have probably seen some of those images, carry across the whole region, across the continent um, from some of those fires in the, in the west, western part of our area. Uh, just to summarize kind of the, the season to date so far regionally, um, we kind, our region kind of includes two areas that they use for wildland fire management, the Northern Rockies and the Rocky Mountain um, coordinating areas together between those two regions. Um, that cover from Montana to the Dakotas and down to northern Colorado. Um, over 5,700 fires and 1.1 million acres burned so far as of this morning. So a really very active year uh, for wildland fires um, across the region. 
Um, as of October 1st, um, uh, Predictive Services at the National Interagency Fire Center um, had put out their, their fire potential outlook map. Um, this is just for October, um, but they had kind of pegged the area of Wyoming, Colorado with significant um, potential for large fires. And so it looks like that unfortunately has held true. Um, I'm not going to show the November map, but it sure does quiet down as we get into their snowy season. Um, so crossing fingers, hopeful and optimistic that they get some snow and cooler temperatures uh, to ease the burden on firefighting out that way. Uh, changing tracks here to the Missouri River a little bit. Um, you know, in 2019, this was the, the story of the year maybe for a lot of us with the uh, really long-term and major significant flooding um, in 2019. Um, this graphic here is from the Army Corps of Engineers um, update on October 6th showing uh, what their storage is in the reservoirs on the river, the main stem of the Missouri River. Um, you follow that red line there and you see the note we are here. Um, the green line was last year, 2019 at this time. Um, you can also see the black line, which is 2011. Um, and so we are below both of those years at this point, much below 2019, um, but still above average. As you see the blue lines right below there, um, that's the long-term average. So still above average for storage for this time of year, but nowhere near where we were last year. Their runoff forecast um, for this calendar year, January through December, is estimated to be 117% of average um, as of about a week, a week ago. Um, on the topic of rivers, um, looking at 28-day average stream flow, so over the last month more or less, um, we have finally seen uh, the James River in northern, south, northeastern South Dakota get out of flood stage, finally, after I believe 546 consecutive days in flood stage. So um, certainly the, the drought has uh, really taken hold of the region. Um, you see a few oranges and reds there as well with uh, some stream flow gauge is much below or below normal for this time of year. And so you can kind of see those hot spots in Iowa and in um, uh, northern Wyoming, Colorado, and so on. And to touch on our Great Lakes water levels a little bit, um, again, last year we were talking about how high the, the lake levels were and looking at shoreline issues and, and impacts that way. Um, still, lake levels are higher than average. On the left is Lake Superior. On the right is Lake Michigan Huron near Harbor Beach, Michigan, as the measurement is taken near Harbor Beach, Michigan. Um, that blue squiggly line near the top, that's where we are currently. Um, that green kind of um, funny flat line is where average, the monthly average is. So still in both lake systems, um, Lake Superior and Michigan and Huron, we are still running above average by, oh, about a foot or so um, foot um, on the Superior side. And on uh, Lake Superior, or sorry, Lake Michigan and Huron, um, a, about two, two and a half feet um, above average for for uh, lake levels out that way. Hey, Laura. Yes. I'm going to make a shameless plug uh, at this time. So this is Doug again, Doug Clark from NOAA. And uh, I believe on the 2nd of November, uh, there will be a Great Lakes focused uh, water levels update and outlook webinar that we'll be running. Um, that's open to anybody. And that information has not gone out yet, but but will. So just want to say uh, it'll be. I think it's nine o'clock Central Daylight Time on the second of November that that will be uh, done. So okay. Sorry to interrupt. Thanks, Doug. That's okay. Thanks, Doug. All right. So looking ahead towards winter season, um, and NOAA released their official winter outlook uh, just this morning. Um, so taking a peek out what's ahead. But first of all, let's. Um, I'll, I'll talk about La Nina first, because that's kind of the, the one of the major players that, that we're looking at for this our winter climate outlook and, and what might be kind of an influencer, so to speak, um, in our region. 
Uh, and then I'll start out with kind of the near term next week or so and look out towards the winter. So uh, starting with La Nina. So uh, officially NOAA has us in a La Nina advisory. Um, that's to say we're in La Nina conditions and expect it to continue. 85% uh, chance of La Nina carrying through the winter season and about 60% if you look at the later winter into spring, that'd be um, through April. So uh, very high confidence that La Nina uh, will be a player that's determined by partly by the sea surface temperatures in the equator region of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so this graph here is um, uh, showing what are the likelihoods of La Nina and the blue bar uh, El Nino in the red bars and neutral conditions in the gray bars. So you see here La Nina um, has dom is dominating the outlook here um, with those very tall blue bars. At the bottom of the graph you'll see those abbreviations. Those are looking at the abbreviations of the months. So first starting with September, October, November on the left and then you see October, November, December November, December, January, and so on. So that's where you see that, um, you know, 90 percent, 80, 85 percent um, over the winter period as we get into DJF, December, January, February, that's about 85 percent. Sorry about that. Um, uh, likelihood of La Nina during that winter season. Um, as you see, you get later into the spring and you start to dip down those probability of La Nina hanging on. It really is primarily a wintertime phenomenon across, across our area. So what does that mean for us? Well, we can get a hint at that um, looking historically, and this is from climate.gov, their, their ENSO blog, which is a really great resource if you guys have a chance to check it out. Um, this is from um, an article they had written maybe a couple of years ago about looking at La Nina temperature in that December, January, February timeline um, of historical La Ninas. And I've highlighted in those red boxes towards the top, those are the strong and moderately strong uh, events uh, historically that we've seen since 1950. Um, just to illustrate how variable uh, the temperature can be in the winter season um, up here in the north central states. A lot of years um, we do see cooler than average temperatures, but not always, and not always across the region uh, is it the same. Um, so with the outlook towards a moderate to strong La Nina uh, coming this winter, this is one of the things we're looking at, or that, that has, has been looked at, um, to lend lend some information towards the winter outlook. Um, next, showing the precipitation side, again, for that winter season, December, January, February. What has precipitation been like in La Nina events since 1950? Again, the same source at climate.gov um, on their ENSO blog. Looking at the north central states, you can look at your area where you're from, and it's kind of a mixed bag. And up here in the Dakotas, um, not a strong sense of wetter or drier necessarily in any of those years. Um, so might be a little uncertainty um, as far as what La Nina could bring towards some of us. But we do see some wetter uh, leanings, at least in the eastern Corn Belt around some of the Great Lakes states. So um, one other piece of the puzzle here to think about as we're looking at La Nina conditions coming up uh, in the winter season with pretty high confidence again of a moderate to strong event. So looking at just kind of the near term, the next seven days, um, looking at uh, some, some decent chances of precipitation coming up here, um, maybe some heavy rainfall um, from Missouri up to Michigan um, with a couple of inches potentially there. Um, and also in the Northern Rockies, hopefully they can get some snow to help ease the wildland fire issues out that way. Um, but relatively quiet through the, the middle here, through the Dakotas down to Kansas and into Colorado over the next seven days. 
as we look out a little longer, eight to 14 days out, so uh, in that one to two week period, this would be October 22nd to 28th. Um, this is from yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon at CPC at NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. Um, you see odds uh, leaning towards uh, cooler than average temperatures up here in the north central states. Um, pretty decent odds there um, with that deeper blue color. And then looking on the right, um, over the Great Lakes, slightly favored towards wetter than average uh, conditions. Again, as we look at that week of October 22nd, 28th. And to look uh, towards the next whole month, so that's the month of November. This was released this morning. Um, starting on the left here with temperature, um, much of the, the lower 48 states uh, favored towards warmer than average conditions, uh, with the exception of uh, Montana, North Dakota, parts of South Dakota and Minnesota, as far as our region of concern up here. Um, so, and you don't see su super great odds of, of warmer, but odds lean slightly towards warmer there um, across the region. And on the, the right here, that's looking at the precipitation side, um, equal chances, that's equal chances of above, below, or near average precipitation in those white areas. Um, but the southern part of our, what we call our central region, so looking at Nebraska and south there, uh, odds are leaning, chances are leaning towards drier than average uh, for the month of November overall. Um, I'll look at two, two, usually we show the first three months ahead of us, that, and in this case that's November, December, January. After this I will show the next jump towards December through February, just to touch on that La Nina story a little more. But here, looking at November through January, you look at those three months overall, very similar story on the temperature side on the, on the left there, um, kind of the north central states. Um, holding on to equal chances of warmer, cooler, and year average, but most of the rest, most of much of the rest of the country here, on the lower 48 at least, sorry, uh, leaning uh, towards warmer than average. On the right side there, precipitation, you see kind of a, a mixed bag. Then you see that wetter pattern kind of come in from the north, um, so odds leaning towards wetter than average um, in the northwestern part of the country and drier in the south. So we see part of our area kind of squeezed in between there in the EC, the equal chances again of, of uh, drier, wetter, and your average for November through January. But when we look further ahead now, looking at December through February, that's when we tend to see a little stronger um, impact of La Nina across the region. And you see that first on the left in the temperature where you see a area of below average temperatures favored in the north north central states there, or Dakotas, Montana, and that area. And, and then on the right, um, you see that wetter area, as I mentioned, that's often favored wetter in the Great Lakes region. But here in this outlook as well, they also favor wetter in the, the northern uh, northern tier states here, the northern plain states. Um, so as I did mention before, you don't always see a, a real strong signal there, but we do have a long-term trend, um, La Nina or not, we do have a long-term trend of many wet winters in, in the last few decades, last couple decades. Um, so that's also a player too. La Nina is not the only story um, as we look towards winter. Um, and, and some of the models are keying up of uh, a wetter signal in the winter, later winter season. Kind of pulling this all together, the seasonal drought outlook was also released this morning, and this is um, valid uh, through the end of January. So at the end of January, what might the drought uh, monitor and drought situation look like? Um, the areas in yellow are favored for drought development um, throughout that the next few months. So um, that's really looking at kind of our southern part of our, our region here in Nebraska, Iowa, and south of there. Um, again, if you look at the outlooks, they're, they've been leaning drier and warmer during the next few months. So certainly that will be a player as we look at uh, drought development and um, how much drought will hold as well. The brown areas are areas where drought will likely persist. 
Um, drought here is defined by D1 or worse on the U.S. drought monitor map. So with that, um, I tried to talk real fast. I made it pretty close, Doug. Um, our next webinar will be November 19th with Justin Glisson out of Iowa. He's our Iowa State climatologist. And um, here's a, a list of links where you can find more information and some more folks to connect with as far as state climatologists, regional climate centers, and so on. And um, lastly, I'll throw up my contact information and some others who helped put some of the information together for the presentation today. So with that, Doug, um, I'll stop there. Uh, I think you got one more slide, but um, don't you? Oh, nope. Nope, okay. okay. Let me shift it over to Brad and see if we can. Hopefully I sent him the right thing. All right, should be sharing yeah. now? Yeah, we see some bad corn. Yep. All right. There we go. Take it away, Brad. Thank you. All right. I will carry on. Thank you, Laura, for the uh, first half of this. And thank you, Doug, for the introduction. And I, I will point out, this is not an ear of corn from the Midwest or the Great Plains. This is from Virginia, which happens to be in my backyard. But I did want to show that this is kind of representative of some of the issues that we saw in the Eastern Corn Belt, why this ear of corn turned out so poorly this year. I'm gonna get into some of the agricultural highlights for the growing season 2020. And overall, at least on paper, it was a good year for US agriculture, but far from perfect if you start digging into the details. We did see a record US yield for corn, 178.4 bushels per acre, and a record tying yield for soybeans, 51.9 bushels per acre. One of the reasons for that is we saw very little heat stress. I know Laura talked a lot about everything kind of averaged down, but really we made it through the growing season without too many days above 95 degrees in the Midwest, a little bit worse as you head westward to the Great Plains. But overall, that was a big key. We did see some very quick planting, unexpectedly fast planting in the Western Corn Belt, but we dealt with some adversity early on in the Eastern Corn Belt that included some flooding. You might remember the flooding we talked about in the, this webinar back in May and in June. Also, that required some replanting for some corn and soybeans. We had a mid-May frost, you might remember. And then during the the grain fill and the pod fill stage of development later in the summer, there were some pockets of dryness. Of course, Iowa took the brunt of that. A pretty significant drought that continues to this point struck Iowa right in the heart of the growing season. And that took a big toll fairly locally on corn and soybeans there. Of course, Iowa, as if it wasn't enough, got hit by the August 10th derecho. And then as Laura was discussing, we saw some early frost in the far upper Midwest and the Northern Plains, frost in the Dakotas, especially in Eastern North Dakota where planting occurred late, did cause some problems for crops on September 8th and 9th. And then as we moved on through into the present, we're seeing worsening drought, especially across the High Plains. And we've seen that late summer and autumn drought uh, reducing hay production, especially in some of our Western areas that has limited moisture for recently planted winter wheats. It's really interesting to look at the Vegetation Health Index, which is a product from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And if you look at it, what really jumps out is all the red colors across the western part of the country. And that is largely indicative of very poor rangeland conditions. Uh, you see that really in, in Colorado and Wyoming in particular. You can also see, really interestingly, the drought and the derecho in Iowa. A lot of the red color in the west part of Iowa is drought. And that east central patch, a lot of that's derecho damage that happened way back in August. And I do want to point out that one of the reasons why we see some of the, the less uh, favorable colors across the western Corn Belt is because of the speed at which this year's crop and the Western Corn Belt has matured and is being harvested. So you see a less green signal than you would normally expect this time of year across that region you know, for early October. Laura showed the regional drought monitor. Here's the big picture for the United States. 
we are now seeing almost two thirds of the country either abnormally dry, which is the yellow coloring, or in drought, which is the other four colors on the map. We actually see for the nation as a whole, almost 47% of the lower 48 states in drought as of October 13th. And that is the highest continental US drought coverage since September 2013, more than seven years ago, when we were still coming out of the drought that peaked in 2012. This is a USDA product that is a subjective measure of topsoil moisture across the country. As reported by a number of agents across the country, and it is showing that we have more than half the country reporting topsoil moisture very short to short on October 11th. You can see this kind of follows the pattern that we've been talking about with drought from the plains westward. And you can see some very high numbers coming in from states like Wyoming and Colorado 87% topsoil moisture currently rated very short to short. This is the upper six inches of the soil. And if you compare that to last year, the change from last year at this time is in brackets. So you can see how dry it is, especially compared to last year at this time. Look at the Dakotas, where we had virtually no topsoil moisture very short to short a year ago. Those numbers are in the 60s now, for example. There's also that patch of shorter term dryness that extends eastward across the Midwest. And really look at Indiana jumping out right now, 75% topsoil moisture very short to short. So uh, quite a, a dry look to the map. And if you put it in a little historical perspective compared to the last five years, this is the highest number we've seen. If you look at all the data going back to 2015 with that 53% very short to short. I did wanna show this topsoil moisture surplus, not because of the number currently, which is very low, but compare this to the topsoil moisture surplus to this time a year ago, which is the number in brackets. So if you add the upper number and then take the number below and put them together, you can see what the numbers were last year. This time in 2019, where we had late maturity and harvest delays, we saw numbers in the 30 to 60% plus range surplus across a broad area of the Great Lakes region and the upper Midwest. So a big difference compared to this time a year ago. I wanted to show this, and we keep referencing 2019 and all the flooding and adversity that we saw. This was the Risk Management Agency's crop indemnity map that I showed in this webinar a year ago. And you can see by the brightest colors there where the counties reported more than $10 million in indemnities. A lot of the areas that were really too wet to plant at any point in 2019, or if they were planted, a lot of them flooded out or just didn't perform. That included the Eastern Dakotas, Northern Illinois, Northwestern Ohio, just to name a few areas. If you look at this year's indemnity map, a lot smoother looking in terms of colors, a lot less in the way of losses based on risk management agency data. But you did see early in the year, we did have some lingering wetness in Northeastern South Dakota. Laura showed that field that never did get planted this year, also extending up into Eastern North Dakota, where we did see some carryover effects from 2019 that did impact the 2020 crop season to some degree. Also see some impacts from drought in places like Eastern Colorado. I'm gonna go through some individual crops, some of the major row crops quickly. This map shows the major and minor production areas, and I'll repeat this for some other crops, so I'll only explain it once. The darker green, that accounts for about 75% of national production based on 2017 ag census data. The uh, lighter colored green is 24%. So you're looking at the shading area, that's 99% of your production area. Individual yellow numbers show the share by state. So your biggest corn production areas, for example, Iowa and Illinois. Corn yield for uh, 2020 expected to be a record, that 178.4. And if you look at individual states, there is the potential based on the October data for record yields in a number of states that includes Minnesota, Indiana, Wisconsin, Kentucky, Michigan, South Dakota, and North Dakota, led by Minnesota with that whopping 202 bushels per acre based on the crop production report. But I do want to note that even in that good overall picture, 
Iowa corn production for 2020 is forecast at 186 bushels per acre. That is down from the initial or August 1st estimate this year of 202 bushels per acre as they've dealt with the drought and the derecho. Corn production, as you can see here, would end up being number two behind 2016. But in recent uh, production reports, going back to the initial one in August, we have seen a decline in expectations based on, so the NAS number, the USDA NAS number is in red. So we started out closer to 15.3 billion bushels. That's been toned down now to just over 14.7 billion bushels. One of the reasons for that U.S. corn production decline expectation is Iowa. Last year, only 3.3% of the Iowa corn acreage was either abandoned or cut for silage. But this year, due to the derecho and drought, that number has jumped to 7.3% of the Iowa corn acreage. Corn conditions as of October 11th, overall not too bad, 61% good to excellent. That's up six percentage points from this time a year ago. But you can see the trouble spots. Iowa and Colorado dealing with drought. Iowa getting the double whammy of the derecho. North Dakota dealing with the September frost. Ohio and other parts of the Eastern Corn Belt. That combination of factors that included the wet spring, late freeze in May, pockets of summer dryness, just to name a few of the adversities that have lowered conditions in the East. I did want to point out the same thing on the very poor to poor side ratings and the same factors listed on the left. But you can see that Colorado leads the nation, 40% of its corn rated very poor to poor. Iowa is second in this region, 26% of the crop rated very poor to poor at present. Corn harvest has been going rather quickly amid the open weather, the dry conditions. 41% of the crop harvested, nine percentage points ahead of the five-year average. The earlier planted corn in the Western Corn Belt coming out very quickly, a little bit slower, but still not too far off the average pace in some of the Eastern production areas where maturation is occurring later. Taking a look at the same thing for U.S. soybeans, there's your major and minor production areas, similar to the corn areas. We see here that record tying potential crop that could tie the record from several years ago, 51.9 bushels per acre. And we do have potential soybean record yields in several states that includes Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Missouri. There's your soybean production numbers. And like corn, that's been toned down just a little bit in the last couple of crop production reports and would end up being a little bit behind some of the numbers we saw a few years ago in 2016, 2017, and 2018. Soybean condition, it's almost a carbon copy of corn. Don't need to spend too much time on this. Overall, 63% good to excellent, up nine percentage points from last year. Same trouble spots like North Dakota, potentially hurt by that September freeze. Iowa drought and derecho are the highlights, and then slightly lower conditions in parts of the Eastern Corn Belt for the reasons we've already talked about. Soybean harvest progress, when you do have open weather, a lot of times the producers will go after the more vulnerable soybeans, more vulnerable to weather. And so we have seen a torrid pace of field work in the Western Corn Belt where the leaves dropped early, the crop matured early. We're gonna be finishing up in some of those Western states in the next few days. Even though it, it's turning colder, still generally open weather for harvest, Seeing those harvest numbers past 80% by October 11th in Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Nebraska. And if you look at the last quarter century of data, it's actually the sixth fastest harvest pace for the nation as a whole. Fastest on record was 69% harvested on October 11th, 2010. Here's another look at the soybean harvest, just comparing to the last five years. On a pace very similar to what we saw uh, in 2015. And then on the far right there, you can see the slow pace of the 2019 harvest amid late maturation and incessant rainfall. Laura talked a little bit about the big fires. We've also had with the dry conditions over the last month, some flash fires or harvest fires that have taken place. This is one new story that appeared, a couple of fires that, 
uh, combine fires that occurred in northeastern Nebraska, Dixon, and Dakota counties. And so that is one of the concerns when you have dry conditions, you have the dust, you have the potential for fires, it just takes a spark. And uh, so we are seeing news stories like this as the dry weather continues. Other ag weather highlights, um, from a specialty crop standpoint, I don't have a slide for that, but as there were some impacts from the May freeze uh, on fruit crops, especially in the Eastern Corn Belt. Uh, pumpkin crops reported to be generally good, but there's been a high demand this year, I guess, because people are staying at home looking for something to do, baking, carving, I suppose. So overall, not too much to report on the specialty crop front since the May freeze. Spring wheat harvest was far faster than last year, already 96% complete in the last report of the year on September 20th. Big increase in sunflower production, up almost 44% from last year, partly on a yield increase, partly on a harvested area increase. The sugar beet harvest is almost finished in the Red River Valley already, way ahead of 2019 production estimate, showing up 25% from last year. Sorghum production up 8.5% from last year, although much of the change is an increase in harvested area. Winter wheat, that's a, getting to be a big story because we have the crop emerging in most major production areas. But autumn establishment is a concern because of the dry conditions. More about that shortly. And then rangeland and pastures are in very, very rough shape per the satellite imagery and ground reports across our western areas along with parts of Iowa and now stretching eastward across the lower Midwest. Still with that, hay yield nearly unchanged from 2019, while production was up 1.4%, largely on the strength of the better pastures as you move to the east and the south part of the country. Sunflowers, very quickly, a lot of the production comes from the Dakotas, which were troubled by flooding and, and uh, late maturation last year. The harvest lingered into 2020, especially in North Dakota. This year though, a good year, and the harvest is going quickly, well ahead of the five-year average in all four production states. The sugar beet harvest, as I mentioned, uh, more than half of the production comes from the Red River Valley and neighboring areas. We are seeing that harvest just about wrapped up in Minnesota and North Dakota. The sorghum uh, crop dominated by Kansas, more than half the crop coming from that state. And we see conditions off a little bit from last year, but you remember production is up compared to last year on that increase in area. And the sorghum harvest progress, very rapid in most of the states we're concerned about, especially in South Dakota. And then finally, a little bit more on winter wheat. We see about half of the production coming from the Great Plains roughly a sixth or so coming from the lower part of the Midwest. We see planting taking place at or ahead of schedule in most states across the region here. But emergence is lagging a bit in several states, a little bit behind average. That is reflective of the dry conditions that hampering emergence and establishment of the crop. So we need some moisture for that crop to become better established now with the cold weather coming down, that's an additional concern because it gives less opportunity for the crop to get established before dormancy. At this time, we see 41% of the U.S. winter wheat production area in drought, including large sections of the high plains, parts of the lower Midwest. That is a sharp upper, upward trend in recent weeks and far above what we saw this time a year ago as we headed into dormancy. Pasture and rangeland conditions across the country, you still see there's some good pastures in the Great Lakes region and south of the Ohio River, including Kentucky, but looking pretty rough as you head further to the west. And if you look at the very poor to poor ratings, we see very high numbers coming in from states like Wyoming, 70% very poor to poor, Colorado at 62%, and we're also above 40% in states like North Dakota, Iowa, and Indiana at 40% as well. If you compare to the last 10 years and do a simple uh, ranking system where you rate based on excellent, good, fair, poor, and very poor conditions, simple uh, scale there listed on the bottom, 
you come up with pasture conditions currently for the U.S. tracking along where we saw in 2011 as we headed into the drought of 2012. So we're seeing our lowest U.S. rangeland of pasture conditions in the last few weeks that we've seen in eight years. And real quickly, just talk a little bit about cattle and hay. We've got 40% of the U.S. cattle in inventory in drought, including the high plains. About one third of the hay production areas in drought at this time, mostly the western half of the country. A lot of reports coming in from Wyoming and elsewhere across the high plains, other western areas, reports of cattle being cold, difficulty in maintaining weight, the need for supplemental feeding, hauling and pumping of water, hay shortages. And so the, the effects are amplifying as this dry weather pattern continues and we head into the cold season. And that finishes up the uh, Ag Summary for 2020. And I'll turn it back over to Doug and or Dennis. Yep, thank you. And um, sure, uh, just a couple of things to follow up on uh, what you just said in terms of uh, dryness overall is, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this. Um, I'll, I'll make the first comment, and maybe Dennis or someone else will, will follow on. But we do like to see recharge. This time of year, what I mean by that is recharge, um, of course, in reservoirs, but all, not so much in reservoirs, but in soil moisture in terms of building uh, water supply for next spring. You mentioned uh, winter wheat having a tough time getting established. That's a major worry, of course, in um, Kansas, Colorado, and some of the other places that are showing showing drought. Dennis, do you want to say more about that? Yeah, you're kind of combining a couple different things there. I mean, we at least need some surface soil moisture recharge uh, because you know, winter wheat hasn't rooted very deeply yet. So you don't need a full profile to help out with the with the winter wheat, but you certainly need something at the surface for it to germinate and to establish itself. And Doug is exactly right. We are beginning to be aware and concerned about refilling that soil moisture profile. We're talking about you know varying whatever the depth is in your area you know four or five six feet of, of, of soil of soil that contains a certain amount of moisture in Iowa for example that would hold anywhere from maybe 12 inches to 14 inches of water uh, when that profile is completely full and, and you like to have at least some of that profile refilled uh, with with moisture uh, before the end of the fall and so far we've not had a of much going into the, the soil moisture bank is another way of thinking about it, it's stored up for next year. And La Nina is not giving us a lot of optimism in the Western Corn Belt. Uh, Eastern Corn Belt, we're dry, but there's less concern because as you saw in the outlooks, we have a better chance of precipitation and climatologically, they tend to get more precipitation over in that area anyway. Um, anything else from any of the other panelists on the sort of ongoing fall dryness comments in terms of, uh, oh, I don't know, something we, we may anticipate. Uh, it's hard to anticipate what's going to actually happen by the springtime in terms of how much wetness, even if it shows above normal precipitation. One of the things we, and, and maybe Dennis just said this, one of the things we have to uh, um, hope is that some of the moisture gets recharged before the ground freezes. Once it freezes, then it's hard to get the it's harder to get the the water down into the profile. So um, that's more of a northern, uh, I suppose, a northern plains, Montana, well, Mon Montana, Minnesota, all that uh, issue. So uh, there are a number of comments and such. Uh, you know, some some people are watching the Colorado River Basin, noting. That how how dry uh, obviously Colorado and Wyoming is, and how low that basin has been for a long time. So La Nina is not friendly usually to the Colorado River basin in terms of uh, wetness. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it, it will be this year, but uh, uh, kind of leans against that. Um, there was um, yeah, there was uh, there, there was a comment about the variability of temperature. Uh, in, in setting some record lows, but uh, coming out sort of average for the month uh, in certain places, and that's definitely been the case. And Laura mentioned that a little bit earlier uh, in terms of seeing a lot of that, as a matter of fact. 
so we've had some wild swings. Uh, that's not that unusual, I guess, for for the fall to see some of those those variations. But this year seems to be uh, more than more than we've seen in the past. Anybody want to comment on that? Oh, well, this is Laura. Just a couple kind of factoids, I guess. You know, we saw in, in, in early September, which maybe this was on the last webinar, but we saw temperature swings from 100 degrees down to freezing within a couple days in the western Dakotas and Colorado and such. And I think similarly in Kansas, not too long ago, they had some very warm temperatures and swung down to freezing as well. So, yeah, I think that's kind of the story the last uh, six to eight weeks has been, um, yeah, just the high variability in temperature. Yeah, for sure. And that which, which brought is, a lot of wind with it too. You know, the, the other yeah. thing is the windy, dry conditions, yep. kind of with a lot of these dry cold fronts passing through as well, um, adding to the fire hazard, the fire risk in the, in the whole region. Which, I mean, the up and down we surely expect to have during the fall, but the dry conditions add to that, that we're able to heat up more quickly and cool down more quickly along with that. Um, some comments about how dry it has been uh, in, in parts of Montana and grasshopper epidemics and such. Uh, we didn't touch on that too much. I heard a little bit about that through the grapevine. Uh, anybody want to comment on pests like that eating up everything? Yeah, we've seen that. This is Laura. We've seen that in South Dakota all season long. Uh, reports of much larger than average grasshopper populations. And uh, it, it's kind of a uh, a complicating factor where it's not directly drought related, but certainly exacerbates or makes the drought situation worse and the impacts worse in those regions in the past year, grass, forage areas. Um, yeah, and, and still without having a hard freeze in a lot of the region, the grasshoppers are having a, a little bonus time out there, which is um, making things a little bit worse, certainly as we get into the winter season. So Dennis and Grass, um, grasshopper grasshopper bonus time. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and another thing too, you know, touching on winter wheat, you know, uh, Brad Brad mentioned how tough it's been to get started in that crop this year. And and again, if we if those areas don't get a hard freeze, those hoppers will feed on on the winter wheat because it's green. Um, so that's another another issue. Nope, for that's a good fall. point. Really good point. Um, this is sort of a a a, a good question that that needs probably we need to go over every year but uh dennis you answered it in the uh uh in the box there but how long how long can corn and soybeans withstand a frost of, of 32 degrees or a little bit less uh versus 28 degrees what what's going to actually end the uh, season for corn and soybeans sure we, we typically assume a 28 degree uh event event of any time that you know an hour or two or more at 28 degrees end of the season between 28 and 32 uh you can stand you know crops as long as they're in reasonably good condition can stand several hours before they um before they they're uh done but there are some mitigating factors that includes you know is the crop stressed in some other way is it you know does it have limited soil moisture or disease something like that derecho you know damaged crops things like that but also in some of these very dry conditions, you can get what, what we get radiative cooling, basically that the temperatures don't drop that, that low, but the, the, you know, the, the crop emits radiation out in the sky very effectively under dry conditions. And that can cool the leaves enough to where they can, you can get some damage or, or, or lose crops completely. Uh, once in a while, you will get, we had one of these back in 2004 when I was in South Dakota, where we could not record a temperature below 32 degrees, but we had some widespread crop losses because of a, uh, what looked to be a fairly radiative condition. And, 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 and uh, you know, it's, the crop just lost all its heat. It was also a little bit drought stressed, I think, too, that, that did it in. So that's, that's the assumption we go by. Okay, I'm going to throw this next one over to Matt. Matt. Are you ready? Matt, are you still yeah. there? All yeah, right. I'm here. So, so it's, uh, it, was, it was commented on, and someone has been watching the 
outlooks and the La Nina forecast through the through this time period, and is commenting that it's interesting how the forecast ha for duration of La Nina has been revised to last now into the spring compared to earlier forecasts, sort of fading it by late winter. Do you want to comment on that at all, or or say that's true or not true? <laughs> Um, so I'm looking at something. So the La Nina forecast goes out about eight months. Um, so if you were doing it, you know, forecast back in, you know, July, um, it wouldn't have extended too far into next year anyway. Um, but so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that you just have more certainty. Um, there's kind of a, a known predictability die off um, in the skill of La Nina um, at about six months. Um, sometimes, you know, some seasons it's six to seven. Um, in the springtime, it's really only about two to three months. Um, you really don't have a lot of um, lead time on there. A lot of lead time where the forecast can be, where we can um, consider them accurate and say that, you know, with, with confidence um, and responsibly make a statement. Um, so, but right now is a, is a really good time when you have a lot of predictability in the system on kind of what it is now is, is it's really likely to hold through the winter and then, in, and then into the spring. Um, whereas once we get to JFM, um, how much, how far that lasts into the spring, um, those may be revised downward again, um, yeah. because there's a little bit less certainty, uh, from JFM out through AMJ. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, so, it's, it's so kind of for both of those. Yeah, you're confident. Basically, your confidence is building as you see the situation evolve. Thus, being able to push that out further and further into the future. That I'm sorry, push out the La Nina uh, duration a little bit further into the spring. That that that's sort of the way I I always take it. It's 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 partially that, and then it's partially based on you know. What we've observed in this in the in the system, you know, in the circulation of the ocean, it's at certain points of the year you can make those statements further out in time. At other points of the year, you really shouldn't be making right. them, right. you know, further out in time. Yep, yep, yep. Um, uh, someone did mention the pheasant population. Probably, but well, I'll just say for the upper plain states and how does that look? Um, I think Laura made a comment. I don't know, Laura, do you want to say any more from a South Dakota point of view? Yeah, from South Dakota point of view, um, the the state did not do uh, their pheasant roadside count this summer as as they had in the past, so we don't have any any good real good numbers to go with. But uh, the spring climate was generally favorable, you know, generally drier, um, and so less stressful. I think there's pretty good brood survival um, this and chick survival, and I know up. Here in my area, I've seen a lot of pheasants around. <laughs> so, um, our pheasant opener uh, is this Saturday. For those of you who don't know, so um, I'm looking forward to a good year. Um, hey, no advertising. No advertising no. allowed. This is a pheasant and you know, there's a no, lot of kidding. crop harvested. So, <laughs> as far as hunters go, they may be able to find them. They're not hiding in as many places. And plenty of grasshoppers. And that is. Right? And that that is a religious holiday in South Dakota. This pheasant opener is a religious holiday. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, uh, there's a comment about corn and soybeans. Uh, uh, corn and soybean crop is uh, mature and ready to harvest. Cold temperatures won't have a major impact uh, uh, unless there's a lot of moisture still in the crop. I think, Lori, you you mentioned that the western part of this region of the, of, of the western of the part of the um, north central area. Is plenty dry and and no no fear of cold cold uh, for the crop. The eastern region has a little more fear in terms of some some not being uh, dried down enough. Um, is that right? Is that basically right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The comments about frost and freeze uh, concerns are really more for the eastern corn belt. Just looking at the corn crop, it's a little slower to dry down. But yeah, here in the western corn belt, I mean, I I've seen some numbers guys get 10 to 11 percent, which is actually a little too dry, maybe. Um, but but really good dry down in the field already. So not too much of a worry out here in the west. Um, okay, so uh, it, it, Brad, 
Hopefully you can hear me. Has there been yes. significant frost damage to corn and soybeans throughout the region? The uh, only place, and, yeah, go ahead. The only place of concern is that early freeze in eastern North Dakota and stretching into parts of neighboring states. Other than that, was, I don't think there's been any real concern. Yep. And that was, yeah, that was in uh, early September, I believe. Yeah, September 8th and 9th primarily. Um, now I'm getting to some I haven't looked at yet. Let's see. Um, thinking about winter outlook here, the equal chance outlook across the middle of the country, especially Nebraska and Iowa, is fairly typical of any winter forecast in this area, whether it's La Nina, El Nino, and she's right about that. Uh, and does this year set up favor a roller coaster type of winter in Nebraska? Um, how about I just say yes? <laughs> so, yeah, there is there is almost always a portion uh, between that cooler and warmer uh, signal, as well as the wetter and drier signal north south uh, that gets caught, if you will, in the EC, the, the notorious EC area. Uh, probably it'll probably flip one way or the other, but uh, as far as our confidence in that, uh, we don't we don't have a strong confidence one way or the other. Uh, thus, the EC. Um, and as you saw from those maps of all the different uh, outcomes from La Nina over the last, I don't remember how many years that is, uh, several years, several episodes, boy, it is tough in the middle of the country. Uh, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas. Go ahead. That was about 70 Comment? years of the data. Yeah. Um, now, one thing we did not get into is later, sort of later in the January, February, March, and February, March, April, uh, realm where uh, if you get further east, there's a stronger signal, especially in the Ohio Valley, for wetter conditions. Um, I know that's not the area that uh, the person who asked the question is concerned about, but um, that's, what, that's about all I can give you. <laughs> Any other comments on that from anybody on the phone? So in addition to the wetter in the Ohio Valley, you do also have a peaking out of a potential dry signal, a very small shift towards dry that extends up into Nebraska in yep. February and March. Really good point. Very good point. Yep. Uh, and, and, and amplification good. of the pattern over at that yep. time period, most west, the east, more north, south. Great, great point. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Um, there's which, already that, Doug, say. which Doug, which reinforces the point we were concerned about the soil moisture earlier that that potential dryness in that nebraska even in the western iowa if that does come to pass would give us higher risk at, at having very dry soils continuing into the planting season next year yep and and uh concern about hay supplies if winter gets cold uh i would say there's already concern for hay supplies i don't know if anybody wants to comment on that certainly <clears throat> west of the missouri there is concern and prices have gone up and there's culling of herds, as Brad said. Um, either one, of, anybody want to comment on that? Hay supplies. Uh, I'll just echo what you said, Doug. <laughs> Same as what I've okay. heard here in, in the Dakotas. Yeah, and they've been supple feed, supplemental feeding for a while, so uh, right. uh, hay supplies already reduced already going into the winter. And pastures, a lot of pastures have been uh, depleted. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, just a general comment I, uh, uh, Comment about uh, weather, uh, wet weather favors more wet weather and dry weather favors more drought. Um, yeah, and certain times of year, I think this is more true than others. <laughs> you know, in, in the summertime, if you, it, it, you can sort of build, if you will, sort of dryness upon itself, as well as wetness. Uh, I'd be interested to see if anybody on the uh, co uh, co uh, comment panel here wants to say anything about wet begets wet, uh, dry begets dry, and all that business. Um, we do see that. We call it persistence sometimes. And it, there is a feedback mechanism uh, sometimes that sets up. Sometimes it's not a feedback mechanism. Sometimes it's just the atmosphere behaving the way it's behaving. Uh, we call them long wave patterns that set up and don't change. Uh, and that's unfortunate for those people caught in the middle, so to speak. Any comments? Yeah, Doug, this is Brad. I would just say that think about some of our western areas like Colorado having the failed monsoon and then La Nina development on top of that amplifying that dry signal further. Right. Good point. Um, 
<laughs> we got a comment from uh, Central South Dakota saying there have been three hatches of, I guess, pheasants in South Dakota. Thank you for that information. Uh, I am assuming that's a good thing and more above normal, more uh, above normal for that. Um, oh boy, here's a tough one. So Dennis, you get to answer this one. No, um, anybody want to comment on more ice storms in the Ohio Valley? And let's just say the whole North Central region. Would we, <laughs> it's a kind of a tough question actually, the more I think about it. Would we favor more ice type of storms in a La Nina year than not? Gosh, I don't know if anybody's done any work on that or not. I'm sure somebody probably has looked at it. There is the blog on snow by uh, so the CPC fellow, um, golly, I'm forgetting his name now, um, uh, the Climate Prediction Center guy, and maybe Matt can remember. He did a nice uh, Baxter? job. Stephen, uh, yes. Stephen Baxter? Yeah, Stephen Baxter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can link up with Baxter, we can if, if anybody wants to question and give us a point of contact, we'll put you in contact with him. He's the winter weather program lead for the weather service now. <laughs> okay, so you're not gonna you're not gonna go out on a limb and, and say one way or the other. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. It's always fun for me to send work to headquarters. Okay, um, yeah, Bryce, we'll have to get back to you on that, and the same with you, Nancy. Um, and because she asked another question and any sense of more rain on rain on frozen ground type episodes that kind of thing and it that those those situations let me just say from a forecasting point of view are tough in the first place and then um and that's in the short term i'm talking about like the next seven days let alone looking out and looking at the climatology over that uh based on the enso signal of the year there may be some work on that if anybody finds it, um, uh, let me know and I'll send it to the right people. Well, and Doug, there's, there's a couple more things we can say on top of that. One, with the La Nina year, I don't know if we could say that we would expect to see more rain or not, that we might tend to be more snow depending on part of the area. But the other part of it is that we don't have, we have very dry soils uh, that probably won't freeze quite the same way as, as when we have wet soil. We have, you know, wetter soils, you can get that top layer of soil frozen very hard. And they'll often call it concrete soils because it's got moisture in it and it freezes solid. So everything's going to run off. When you have drier soils, it doesn't freeze quite the same way. It can freeze deeper, but it, it doesn't freeze quite the same way. So you still might be able to take up some rain with these drier soils than we would have under the really uh, hard frozen top soils. Yep. And what screen are you seeing all uh, right now, Dennis? When you um, for the uh, webinar, uh, it's the the background screen, like the home screen. Oh, okay. I'm trying to show my screen. I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to show the the risk of hazard temperatures just because. I see the runner uh, on the beach. Oh, you do? Okay, hold on. Oh, let me try this. How about now? We got you. There it is. We see you. you see the map of the world, of United States? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So one thing Laura hinted at but didn't show um, is the hazard map uh, for the next or for days, uh, whatever days this is, the 23rd to the 29th. Uh, I think this is new. Yeah, this is brand new today, and that area up there could see record cold. Uh, there's ch the better chance of record cold. All that area in the blue, within the blue, um, is 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 likely to be below normal in terms of temperature. Some of that may be record setting. So I just wanted to throw that in at the end. We don't have any more questions. So at this point, I think um, we can end the call. And I do want to thank uh, Laura and Brad, especially for all your time you put in on this presentation. I uh, thank you very much. Thank for everybody who got on the call. If you have questions and you didn't get them answered, um, there's a whole list of us who can uh, either answer them or send you to the right person. Thanks, Matt and Dennis and Andrea for being on the call as well. Uh, we'll see you next month on Thursday, November 19th the uh, week before Thanksgiving. So have a great month and talk to you all later. Thank you.